Good morning, everyone, and, and good good afternoon to those out uh, in, in the Middle East and, and areas uh, areas beyond. Um, I'm a Lieutenant General, retired Terry Wolf. I'm the Director of NISA, and uh, uh, we are excited today to have a session uh, focused, again, on the Indian Ocean region, particularly on NAVSEN's role, Naval, Command, Naval Central Command's role in the Indian Ocean region. Um, We've run about 22 focused sessions um, on this region, and we are in, uh, excited today, today to have uh, Rear Admiral Renshaw, the Deputy Commander of the United States Naval Forces Central Command with us to discuss NAVSEN's role in this, in this area. Um, what's critically important in our mind is that uh, the, the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies has about 10,000 alumni uh, spread around the world. And uh, in, increasingly, uh, we and they have taken a, a, a focused interest in the Indian Ocean region. So we thought it was important uh, to get uh, NAPSEN's view on all this because they have an, a, an integral role in all of this. And we're, as I said, excited today to have the Deputy Commander of uh, United States Naval Forces Central Command with us. And with that, I'd like to turn uh, the microphone over to uh, Jeff Payne. Professor Jeff Payne, our, our, our moderator who runs this project on behalf of the NISA Center. Jeff, the mic is, is in your hands, sir. Please continue. Thank you, General Wolf. Uh, Admiral Renshaw, thank you again for uh, joining us for this series. Uh, we're going to launch into the first question, given uh, the scope, scale, and complexity of the area of the responsibility you deal with. Um, and that first question, sir, is related to what's going on right now. Um, what is the focus currently of, of NAVSENT? What is your area, what, what are you concentrating on at the current moment, sir? So, uh, thanks, Jeff, and uh, General Wolf, thank, thanks for including us here today. And, you know, I, I, would, I would start by just saying, you know, uh, Admiral Paparo uh, is our commander, and on behalf of him and the entire multinational, and I emphasize multinational team here, both ashore and afloat, um, it, it's a real privilege to, to talk to such an esteemed group. Um, it, and I should say, as a bit of a disclaimer, when we talk about NAVSENT or Fifth Fleet, you know, we are in the Fifth Fleet hat, uh, a naval maneuver force, a tactical maneuver force assigned uh, currently to the Red Sea, Arabian Gulf, and, and then the Western Indian Ocean. And then as a Naval Forces Central Command, you know, we're COCOM uh, component commander uh, where we can contribute uh, to an operational uh, execution and operational planning, but but also have a, a tactical role in that. So all that to say is, you know, our role in strategy and policy uh, is minimal, uh, if existent at all, in uh, in terms of any kind of direct contribution. Um, but, you know, to, to kind of talk about, hey, what what's important, what's on our minds today, what are we focused on? Uh, I think there has to be a little bit of a strategic context, you know, an understanding on our, our, our end of what that strategic context is and then, you know, how our operational planning and tactical execution um, leads to that. And, um, and so I, I thought I'd just go over, you know, some of the, uh, you know, where we see the importance of maritime, uh, not only in this region, but uh, throughout the world. And then, you know, to us, the partnerships. You know, that's the linchpin of global security and stability. Um, and then what we do to make sure that those partnerships are grounded in a shared understanding of the battle space here, you know, the peace space, uh, which is what we're really trying to work towards. Um, and then I, I should, you know, drill down a little bit into some of that day-to-day -day execution. So um, you, you have a very diverse group of alumni, but uh, at least some of them, I think, were some wore some sort of naval uniform, and, and those of us in the Navy have a lot of uh, exposure to Alfred Thayer Mahan and a lot of his poly, his, uh, his writings, you know, throughout our uh, professional military education and just our naval careers. And if you look at Mahan's work, you know, he talks about the Great Highway, uh, Great Highway of the High Seas, you know, which is uh, used for global maritime commerce. And then the role of the Navy is to secure that highway. Uh, for peace, uh, freedom of navigation, security, and control the sea uh, when and where required. But it really is about that security. 
So if you look at our region today, you know, I think uh, Manhattan's relevance absolutely resounds. Uh, it is indeed a super highway. And um, we talk about the you know, that very predictable monsoon flow uh, has gone on for centuries, you know, forever. Um, and then you have the nexus of cultures and religions that's here. Uh, in the maritime geography, if not just the, the land geography, really does make this the maritime crossroads. Uh, so uh, our, our western view of, of the region, you know, is, is just a small chapter of, of what's gone on for millennia in this crossroads. And so uh, super tankers, oil, supercomputers, all of those recent developments are really just the, the, the most recent chapter in all of that. So uh, in the end, you know, it, it is it is just one piece of that that enduring uh, importance of this region. And uh, but, but I wouldn't under, undersell the, the relevance of the current chapter. You know, we got 30 percent of the world's energy supply is coming through the Straits of Hormuz or through the Bab al Mandat, you know, connecting uh, the Red Sea and the, the Arabian Gulf to the Indian Ocean. Um, so when we think about that's going, you know, 75 to 80 percent is probably going west to Asia, uh, a little bit to the United States. Uh, a lot of it, the rest, most of the rest goes to Europe. Um, but uh, you know that that dynamic defines the present. But just that rich history and uh, you know the current density of the maritime commerce in this re region reinforces what my hand was talking about when we think about maritime security and, and really even a more recent phenomenon, the benefits of a regulated global commerce. So um, my hand talked about the Navy's kind of controlling the seas, uh, but if you fast forward 50 years from my hand, you get to the, the Atlantic chart. And, um, and so the idea of our current maritime commerce uh, or, or constructs and conventions, I think really come from the Atlantic Charter and, and that envisioned uh, some basic values and ethics and goals uh, for that stability. And um, if you haven't read the, the Atlantic Charter lately, uh, you know, a couple of key points are economic cooperation on a global scale, uh, the principle that all people have the right to self-determination, um, lowering barriers to trade among nations, uh, that nations would work toward a world without fear. And then the most important one to what we're talking about today is, in fact, the freedom of the seas. So that Atlantic Charter model, um, you know, the principles of that uh, in the application of the global maritime has resulted really in, I would say, uh, probably the most explosive worldwide growth uh, economically um, over the past 50 years of its unparalleled in world history. And, and if you've been to this region a lot, you know, my first time was probably 30 years ago. If you walk, uh, if you come to Bahrain and you haven't been here in 30 years, or you look at Dubai, uh, or you go to Doha, Qatar, uh, some of these maritime cities, or, or, or a number of cities in the region, uh, you can see the absolute profound impact on a secure maritime environment and a, and a common trust that, that rule set and that stability uh, will, will allow everyone to gain. Um, what we've seen in the past 10 to 15 years, uh, and there's always been those elements, is a little bit disturbing uh, because there are now those who reject those very principles. Um, they believe that control of the sea is not about the free flow of commerce, not about international norms and regulation, but uh, more about denial of the sea. So when they think about control of the sea, they're thinking about the denial of the sea to others and keeping it to themselves for that self-enrichment. Uh, so they're threatening the global order because their gain is at the expense of others. And, and there's always healthy competition, but they, they want to deny uh, that global commons for their own use. Um, at the small end of that scale is, is things like pirates and non-state actors and uh, illicit activity. That also has existed. You know, I think the first boat sailed on the monsoon to trade something, and the second boat that sailed on the monsoon was pirates to try to go intercept that. So, so you know, that that's been around. But, but now we really have you know, nation states uh, who actually probably benefited from that at a point of view. 
um, who are now uh, trying to promote an alternate vision or visions. And so this is a contest between countries who seek uh, hegemony rather than partnerships. They build navies not to support global or regional prosperity, but to deny it to others. Uh, they want to dominate the international straits. They want to dominate seas. And in some of those seas they want to dominate, they think their claims are tenuous, uh, contested, and by global standards, uh, in many cases, just outright illegal. Uh, we see encroachment on the easy EZs of other countries. Uh, we see illegal expansion of EZs, um, and it's 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 a lot of places in the globe right now. It's from the Arctic, uh, the South China Sea, the Black Sea, and uh, here in the Middle East, it, you know, we are uh, faced with a full spectrum of non-state and state-sanctioned illegal action. So our plate here on a daily basis is is full. Uh, you know, when we think about our partnering to ensure that freedom of the maritime, um, we have threats from piracy, uh, there's drug smuggling, there's uh, smuggling of weapons, people, charcoal, um, and all of those actually have strategic consequence because uh, the money from that is often used to fund terrorism or other illegal activity. Um, and more, the growing threat continues to be that state-directed threat, and uh, most explicitly for us it's Iran. Uh, in the Gulf of Oman, uh, the Arabian Gulf, you know, we've seen the activities over the past year, the threats to shipping. Uh, their proxies in Yemen have uh, made the Red Sea a little bit of a different environment than it, it was even 15 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, when they say the Persian Gulf, you know, we, we, we tend to say Arabian Gulf. Persian Gulf has a long history as the name of the, the body of water. But, uh, they don't see that as the historical name as much as they see that as now a right of ownership. And um, and so, you know, I think, again, uh, that that's something we face day in, day out here. Uh, we, we do have the, the Russia and the PRC. I mean, they're, they're part of that alternative narrative or that alternative view of, of how the world ought to be run, you know, kind of a Darwinism of uh, uh, rather than that uh, Atlantic chart of approach. Um, but, uh, you know, Ron probably keeps us uh, up on a more daily basis. So, you know, to us in the maritime, uh, the key element to countering all these threats uh, are like-minded partners and allies. And, um, you know, if, uh, if you watch old American Westerns, you know, the, the whole town comes together to, to defeat the bully who, you know, would try to pick them off one by one, but together they're way too powerful. So, you know, whether it's piracy, which is, suppressed um, or you know regional antagonist uh, or any state that wants to create these new norms uh, for advantage at the expense of kind of each of us individually you know collectively um, we, we, we can do a lot and so within this region we've got a lot of enduring constructs we've got you know, NATO partners uh, we've got the combined maritime force which I, I I'll talk a little bit more about but uh, which is really our enduring uh, strength for maritime security. Uh, and they partner, we partner very well with the EU naval force. You know, Operation at Atalanta is going on. So, so there, there's some overlaps there between our European partners and CMF. And then, and then more transient or temporary constructs to address specific problems. Uh, IMSC, also known as International Maritime Security Drug Task Force Sentinel. That's one of those, you know, where we had a problem and uh, like-minded partners came together to address it. So I think that that formula resonates. And if I think about um, those partnerships and, and people standing up to a bully in those common interests, you know, there's one Iran in the region where there's, you know, one Russia or China. Um, but uh, you know, we had the international maritime exercise last November. And we had 50 different countries, 5,000 people from 50 countries uh, participated in that. So, you know, 50 countries, their, their political spectrum is all over the place. I mean, they're not, they're not aligned to you know, kind of one common political interest, but they did share the interest in the freedom of the seas and the maritime. So, and, and, and beyond the 50 countries that participated, we have seven international organizations, commercial organizations. Um, and, you know, 40 different naval vessels participated. A lot of countries, you know, that 
to get a naval vessel to the Middle East is a big deal. And uh, uh, 17 different aircraft, 18 different EOD uh, groups. So, you know, for them to come together, despite whatever politics and challenges, to do that exercise tells me there's a, there's a pretty healthy appetite uh, for that rules-based approach to the maritime. And uh, the thing that maybe makes me most proud of that is that one of the serials we did uh, was about denying the seas to others. It was all about keeping the shipping moving to keep those 50 countries you know, healthy and, and economically. Um, so those kind of tremendous partnerships uh, that are rooted in trust are really important to us. And, and that's why we, we work very hard on them. These, these aren't transactional things where you know, I'm going to team up with you today uh, to work against this partner. You know, uh, it, it is it is true about enduring uh, commitment to the principles that have led to this economic uh, prosperity. And uh, and so, you know, I think that greater understanding of, of frequent interactions and exercises among those nations um, facilitate the, the construct, constructs that give us that common shield the defense against those who would threaten the, the global maritime commerce or who would try to undermine um, the, the world order that has been so successful for everyone. Um, and so it is tremendously powerful when despite politics or capabilities, languages, whatever, um, we come together to commit to doing something that's right. And, uh, we continue to commit to those peaceful and prosperous maritime standards. Um, we did think they can only be achieved by a preponderance of like-minded partners, and uh, you know we open open the door to anybody who wants to, to, to partner under those those principles, and that's interagency, uh, nations, uh, you name it. Uh, but we all work with that understanding of uh, you know our operating base, our goals. Um, you know, we know how to wage high end kinetic warfare. Uh, we're the best at it, uh, but you know that that's uh, a part of the job that we do. But it's really about those ideals, and uh, that we can withstand challenges and create trust uh, to counter those who try to sow distrust out. Um, and uh, so that's that's really what's on our mind. We want to have that stability. Uh, we want to work with the partners, and uh, with those partnerships, we get that added capability and capacity uh, wouldn't be ours alone. And, uh, and we, we tend to think, you know, that's the way ahead in the region. Um, so, you know, as I walk around at uh, our region at any one time, we've, uh, we've, we've had tremendous success recently, uh, despite COVID, in in and continuing to have those partnerships. And uh, as I said, you know, we can talk a little bit about CMF uh, in our dialogue, but uh, uh, even at the bilateral level, um, you know, we just completed an exercise in Jordan. We just, uh, a week later, we did an exercise with Qatar. We're about to do an exercise with Kuwait. Um, we have done a number of uh, serials, you know, kind of one-off events within the Gulf, uh, on small boat defense, uh, you know, air defense, uh, with uh, both the Saudi Arabians and uh, the Emiratis. Uh, we just had a port a ship pull into Dukum Oman. So, you know, across the region, um, that that is that's our enduring focus is, is really on those partnerships and the natural outgrowth of those partnerships. Uh, you know, the the bigger lines of effort of strategy or policy of, uh, of uh, great power competition, or, uh, whatever the, the strife of the day is against Iran, you know, those all really just come back to, to the, those partnerships. Uh, so uh, that's, that's kind of what we're up to today, uh, uh, you know, on the, on the big picture. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm happy to, to take some further questions too on uh, anything more specific. Well, thank you, sir. Um, I think that was uh, not only uh, immensely informative, but I, I think also shows the expanse of the of the problem set. I think a lot of people, especially when they consider kind of U.S. naval presence in in the larger Middle East region, um, 
There's a lot of taking things for granted about what the U.S. does and does not and what regional partners do and do not do. Um, and you kind of ran the gambit there of kind of the complexity. Honestly, it's enough to drive someone kind of insane um, with all of the various um, components of the challenges that come up. Um, before we move on to, to some of the issues about a specific theater we're interested in, and that's the Red Sea, um, the, the issue, of course, I mean, one of the, the, the ever-present specters over 2020 has been COVID. Um, yeah. How has 2020 impacted your work with partners and allies, whether they be uh, partners and allies in the region or partners and allies who are non-regional? Um, how has this business been a normal? Have you overcome the challenges of COVID? Has there been um, alterations and adaptations you've had to implement? How has 2020 treated um, the Fifth Fleet and NAVSET? Uh, yeah, so I, I, there's probably no in the world that COVID hasn't uh, you know, had a profound impact on on, on how we operate. And, uh, you know, from the most tactical, and I mean the most tactical on base of you know, how to get the gym back open uh, to, to the, 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 you know, how, how do you connect with partners? You know, we, we, we put a lot of air miles in and, and sea miles before COVID uh, to, to build these connections. And so... Um, if I go back to you know March when when this first started and uh, there were so many unknowns with COVID and um, it, 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 our job could not be in some parts of the world you know the, the job was prevent COVID uh, we we had a job to do on the seas but at the same time uh, the prevention of of COVID doing that job. Uh, was was very high and it made made things hard. So uh, a lot of a lot of doors got closed and um, and we were mostly successful or, or actually very successful in, in keeping COVID uh, out of our our military workforce and, uh, and our ships and our, our squadrons. Um, but you know, sometime in April or May, uh, we realized that, uh, that COVID probably wasn't going to go away, and um, you know, we were riding on all of the previous trust you know we had a lot of capital in the bank common understanding we we we've done so much together um that that we could just kind of ride that uh, but as we saw different forces enter the region or, or leadership changes or just just to, you know if you don't talk then you start to see some divergence of ideas and and sometimes um, we started to look for ways to, to get back to a normal, and uh, and not really. I, actually, I should say, go ahead to a normal. Going back to normal was was impossible. It, it probably will be for for a while, but but redefining a normal uh, where we are getting a mission done and uh, continuing to do the things we want to do um, with a in a COVID environment. So. So there are little steps that, that you take, and, and we're on a journey to, to restore all of that. Um, but I mentioned, you know, the, uh, uh, the 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 exercises we're doing. You know, so, so you know, we we had both us and our partners um, as canceled some of the exercises we're going to do, and I, and I don't mean canceled. Postpone is a better term. But uh, you know, we just either had had to worry about COVID, or we couldn't quite figure out how to get it done. Um, since about August, you know, we have we have had the chance of planning, you know, from probably May through June and July to figure out how to get there, and we've learned so much about uh, how COVID is transmitted, how we would treat it, um, you know, uh, th things that were were very one-off concepts of operations are now just kind of standard operating procedures. So, so you know, one of the things about a military is we're really good at collecting lessons learned and, and just building that catalog that becomes uh, uh, a, a, uh, a normal way of doing business. So I mentioned it a, a little bit ago, but, uh, you know, when we were able to operate uh, with Jordan um, in our Defender series, uh, we, we flew, we, we bombed, we flew EOD teams up, we flew Marines up, uh, and then we pulled ships in from the Red Sea and did exercises in the Gulf of Aqaba. We did a lot of planning, a virtual construct, and uh, 
and we had a lot of mitigations in place to, uh, you know, you'll see pictures of sailors and Marines on the range uh, standing at a safe distance from each other with masks on, um, but, you know, also doing VBSS uh, because we really kind of understood how to, how to mitigate the, the threat of exposure and wear the right PPE. Um, and so we've expanded on that. As I said, we're, we're getting, we're back into that exercise sequence. Um, we had a, we've had a couple of CMF conferences now uh, on calls like this, you know, where previously we, all the heads of navies or their representatives would fly in here and we'd pack a room. Um, now we have the big, um, you know, I'm old enough to remember Hollywood Squares, you know, it looks like that, that on the board, you know, with, with all the different uh, the, the players involved. So um, I, I would say, you know, we're very close to business as usual. Uh, we've we figured out, as I said, you know, we did the VBS exercises. We're now doing boardings. Um, and, um, and we're able to, to do those uh, pretty effectively. Um, and, and, you know, we just had uh, Operation Sea Shield was a uh, CMF uh, CTF-150 um, Operation that went for a couple of weeks, and uh, you know we had a, a boarding of a ship that yielded uh, about 18 million dollars uh, worth, or you know, it was 450 kilos, which is a big, <laughs> a large number of methamphetamines. Um, uh, the same at this during the same operation, uh, you may or may not have uh, heard about uh, you know, USS, Winston, USS Winston Churchill uh, was hailed by a Dow that was in distress and. Uh, to the town distress, which had an Iranian flag, uh, which goes back to, you know, uh, that that shared commitment of maritime. When you're on a, a ship at sea that's in trouble, uh, you know, your rescuer uh, is 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 not as who your rescuer is is not as important as being rescued. So, you know, we were able to pass in food and water, and uh, we, we we actually didn't have the parts to fix our engine, but uh, we were able to, to coordinate to get the uh, Omani Coast Guard out. So. Um, COVID is uh, is challenging, um, and uh, it it has made us uh, reconsider uh, the connections that were often so easy to make work, and uh, you know reinforcing uh, communications and a common understanding takes more work. Um, but uh, you know the thing that probably allowed us to weather uh, the nadir of, of of COVID communications out here. Um, but was all of the work we've already done together before that. So, so that that put some capital in the bank. Uh, we we went uh, through kind of a period of trying to figure it all out, and um, and, and kind of one step at a time, uh, we we figured out how to move people around, how to connect with our partners, and um, how to do so in a way that uh, that um, mit mitigates the risk of COVID. And um, you know it, it's it's a global pandemic, so there's always going to be a risk. But uh, uh, and I knock on wood, you know, but we have not had uh, a proliferation of of, uh, of outbreak in, in any of our forces, and um, and so that's that's the COVID front. Um, Thank you, sir. Um, I, I I asked the question primarily because just uh, this interruption, this global interruption, reminded people so much of the importance of cooperative efforts. Uh, it pointed out when naval forces or Coast Guard or other constabulary forces in the maritime space were not active because they were trying to um, protect their borders against a pandemic, uh, of how essential they are for everything from stopping crime to uh, different actors, uh, traffickers, and so forth. Um, and and you, you highlighted that in your response. Um, to transition that, I mean, some uh, an area that has been very active Increasingly, with both regional actors, non-regional actors, and then of course illicit actors, has been the Red Sea. Um, I had a, a friend in the Navy who used to describe the Red Sea as a very peaceful lake before getting into the insanity of the Gulf, and that seems to be changing um, with all the coastal investment uh, by Qatar, by the Saudi, uh, the Saudis, by the Emiratis, by the Turks. Uh, you obviously have the, the United States, France. Um, and the PRC with basing uh, in Djibouti. And then the waters of the Red Sea are just getting more crowded, uh, uh, particularly since the Yemen conflict um, intensified. So what what is the what is the kind of viewpoint uh, on the complications regarding the Red Sea specifically? Because when it comes to the 
the, the, your AOR, the Gulf gets a lot of the attention, and rightfully so. Um, but the Red Sea is something that increasingly matters, um, and I like to hear your views on 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 how you see that that puzzle. Yeah, uh, go back to COVID. I hate to you know, labor what's what's in the news all the time, but one of, one of the things you said uh, you know uh, resonated with me, and um, I the, the other thing that's allowed us to weather COVID is our tremendous partnership with our host nation here in Bahrain, uh, specifically for Fifth Fleet in the you know, the, the personnel station here in Bahrain. So uh, I, uh, I I would have been remiss not to acknowledge that, you know, our testing capacity is, is very much due to the ability of Bahrainis to test. Our ability to quarantine people has been, you know, good agreements with the Bahrainis and our hotels. And, uh, and, and so, you know, a country that's uh, relatively, you know, not relative, that is small, um, you know, has has actually very been very effective. I think in in managing COVID, they have eradicated it, and um, but they have a, a very scientific, direct approach to it, and uh, and we we have been able to leverage that here. I, 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 I what I said about all of our success in mitigating COVID would not have been possible without. Them. Um, and, and so, you know, shifting to the, your discussion on the Red Sea, that, that's absolutely right. First time I went to the Red Sea in the 1990s, um, you know, we had gone through the Suez Canal, which which is uh, it's a long transit. It <laughs> requires intense concentration. And so when you spit out the other side of the Suez Canal, as everything opens up in the Gulf of Suez, and, and now you have fairly wide shipping lanes, it was our time to rest and repair uh, you know, for entry into the Gulf of Oman and in the show. Uh, that is no longer the case. It's a busier waterway than it was uh, back then. Um, and and there, there, there are true, you know, there's, there's naval operations throughout it. You, you mentioned you know, the, it is not uncommon to encounter an Egyptian ship down in the Bab el-Mandab. Um, and so, you know, I... I think it probably that uh, that Red Sea challenge, and, and if I just talk about that entire side of the Arabian Peninsula, the Red Sea, the Bab el and, and then even into the Gulf of Aden, all kind of previously uh, were, were just an area I went through. Uh, if you go back to you know the 2010 time frame and a little before that, we saw the explosion of piracy in the, the Gulf of Aden and the Horn of Africa. I think that's that's the first time you know we, we had a, a larger military footprint that, that was enduring there and, and actually you know uh, CMF plays a huge role in that to this very day. That that's really the place where if uh, uh, you mentioned Djibouti, but you know, the, the Chinese in the region, the military capacity, um, you know that's what brings them there is the security of the Chinese shipping and, and the counter piracy missions. I mentioned Atlanta. All of those are are centered around the Gulf of Aden and around the Horn of Africa and then uh, up toward the Babel Mandab. Um, and then in uh, 2016, um, the, the Yemeni conflict really spilled over into the Maritime. And um, in, in the, the Houthis um, were the beneficiaries of, uh, of Iranian technology and capability um, that uh, um, was applied immediately, and then the Iranians were the beneficiary of getting to see how stuff their stuff worked in in in, in, in sort of sort of sea denial uh, choke point uh, denial uh, so, so you know the mine threat um, is uh, is is real. Mines have been laid there. Um, we've had uh, U.S. destroyers who were fired upon with uh, anti-ship cruise missiles. Uh, we've had. Um, uh, surface to air activity, uh, including our own drones, uh, being shot down um, in, in that, that AOR. Um, the USV, under, uh, under surface vehicle uh, vessel threat, um, evolves. So we've had, uh, you know, the Saudis have um, had a number of ships either underway or in, um, hit by different manners of, of these vessels. And um, we see a continued uh, proliferation of, of those weapons and, and capabilities. Uh, 
in, you know, in the last year alone, uh, the U.S. Navy has interdicted the, the, the ship. We, we interdicted two high-end ships. We've had other interdictions, and um, you know, th those are those are weapons that are uh, are, are uh, the most complex in the world. You know, it's a, it's a true commoditization of precision capability, um, and um, the Saudis and the Emiratis have, have interdicted those weapons. So. Uh, the Red Sea, you know, it's it's really defined, I think, by the Yemen conflict and then uh, the the Iranian influence on proxies and who see great benefit in a number of areas to do that. Um, also have that suppression of piracy and, and you know, let's not forget that Ida and ISIS uh, are are both still operating out of Yemen and uh, have maritime. Aspirations, and uh, you know, we're we're less than six months from the last, uh, at least, attempted uh, terrorist attack in the maritime. So that the demand signal, um, the threat is different, but the demand signal exists in, uh, in the Red Sea and uh, the Babo um, and Dab, and so we've seen the. Uh, you know, if you look at our IMC International Marine Security Construct Charter, you know there is a there is a Sentinel station on the Red Sea side, and, and we man that uh, as much as we can uh, with with a U.S. or a coalition uh, ship. Um, and then, uh, there, as you mentioned, the Yemen, UAE, uh, UAE, and uh, Saudi Arabia will operate down there. Um, so the stability of the Red Sea is uh, is, is I, I mentioned you know some of the oil that comes out of it, the, the Persian Gulf uh, Arabian Gulf turns left some of it turns right it's going to Europe uh, yeah stability is really important um, and then the North Sea is uh, it, it, it's it's growing too there, there's just uh, uh, you know the Egyptians just opened Berenice a port up there. Uh, and uh, the Saudis continue to develop a lot of their ports. And I, I mentioned the, the uh, exercise uh, that we, we've done with Jordan. But, uh, they're really a key partner in, in the, you know, the, the northern uh, Red Sea. And, and I, I don't know that there's probably any country in the region or the world that's really, um, you know, they're, they're not, maybe have a Navy built for blue water and a high-end fight type of thing. But their capability uh, in terms of maritime uh, security, if we think about visit board search and seizure, VBSS type boardings, health and comfort boardings, uh, EOD, so those sorts of things, they are, they are really, really good. And, uh, and we continue to work with them. And um, you, you may or may not know, you know we had uh, Jordanian in command uh, for a period of one of our CMF task forces. So, uh, so they, they are a major player in the region and uh, you know, a major source, I think, of stability in the North Red Sea, along with Egypt, uh, who, who has a, a you know, tremendous capability uh, on the other side of the Red Sea and um, is a, a, you know, kind of a gateway to, to uh, not just because of but if you think of their ports on the Mediterranean, really a bridge between fifth and sixth fleet. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to echo what you said because, I mean, from my point of view, um, you know, working at NISA and, and engaging throughout the Indian Ocean region, I think um, one of the things that's discussed in outside of, of your AOR, in the Middle East, uh, beyond the Middle East, is the need to stand up a littoral security, coastal security, you know, coast guards, constabulary forces, and that's where the capacity is, and a lot of these reach for the blue water capabilities. And I think Middle East is a good example where states have, have stood up their constabulary ability. Um, Jordan is an ex excellent example. Oman is another. Egypt, uh, Bahrain, a UAE. Um, and, it, and honestly, I mean, speaking as, a, as an American, um, it frees up the U.S. Navy to handle some of the larger missions that honestly are critical for national interest. So um, this, I guess, is a natural lead to the final question for you, sir. And, uh, and again, thank you so much for carving out time. Um, obviously, everyone in Washington always thinks about the future. Um, we don't think about now. We're thinking uh, six months, five years, ten years down the road. Um, and this, and, and I, I say for someone who deals with the maritime domain, that the 
it's ever present for a sailor. Um, you got to look to the horizon at all times to see what's what weather's coming. Uh, you know what what's just coming at you. Um, so what do you see for your AOR? Um, and for the fifth fleet and nav sent coming down the road, uh, do you think the challenge challenges will remain roughly the same, or do you see new challenges emerging uh, that will will require new attention by the United States? Um. They're probably the same challenges, but but harder, <laughs> if if that makes sense, you know. And and, and so I, uh, I, as as we look ahead, you know, the the, the idea of uh, doing what we do well and, and partnering with our partners to do it, what they can do very well, is I think a key to to our success in the future. And. Uh, the Saudi border guards also have commanded CMF. The Kuwaiti Coast Guard is commanded within CMF. So uh, uh, the UAE uh, Coast Guard is a, is always a contributor, actually, to the, uh, the task force Sentinel and the IMSC. Um, so you know, what we're doing right now, um, I, I mentioned the CM as the enduring construct here. And so. Aside from exercises, 33 like-minded partners is a pretty strong construct, and they all bring certain strengths to the table. We all have weaknesses, but if we have all the strengths of 33, we tend to counteract those weaknesses. So, so you know, our our long-term thought for the region is that uh, you know the the, the uh, Iran Iran uh, pressure on Pretty much everybody is, is probably always going it, to. It's going to have ebbs and flows in that competition, but it, but it's probably a lasting. You know, there's no uh, no difference uh, between democracy on the horizon in Iran that, that I can see. So so we're probably going to be faced with 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 that for some time. But um, you know, the more the regional partners really do the stability. Um, Within the, the the waters of the Gulf, and then you know, with with us here is 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 to help lead and coordinate. I, I think is important. Um, as we look at uh, uh, you know, power competition, is one of those words that when I was in the Pentagon, the National Defense Strategy is uh, comes up a lot, and uh, you know, the that competition is is global. You know, I, I've heard some people say global power competition, and, and certainly um, a big section of the one belt, one road um, uh, miles goes through this region. Um, but that that competition is also not just in the military, it's diplomatic, it's information, it's economic, it's all, all of those things. It, and so, you know, I, I, I kind of go back to where we started with the, uh, the idea of a um, global order that is for the betterment of all. And so I think our, our idea of regional and maritime stability in that global order is, um, is, is really important, and, and that's, that's really the peacetime focus. Um, the other thing that pulls people, I think, into that, that maritime is um, yeah, the the U.S. You mentioned different people define the the Western Indian Ocean in ways. So the U.S. Uh, tends to have these COCOM combatant commander boundaries, and, and are a little bit defined on, on landward terms. And, and so those of us who live in the maritime are always on a seam a little bit. Um, you know, in the Pacific, you've got a Northcom um, Indo PACOM uh, boundary. You know, on the on the west coast of the U.S., you've got ships in San Diego that are sitting in the middle of Northcom territory. Really work for Black Fleet and Indo PACOM, but can be assigned across that. Um, so out here, you know, there's that imaginary line in the Indian Ocean, um, uh, and then there's another imagine between Indo PACOM and Centcom, and then there's another imaginary line between Africom and um, um, and and Centcom. There's really like one fleet that's here. You know, Sixth Fleet probably isn't going to come sailing through with Mount Whitney to, to mount some operations down there. You know, so we, we have really good collaboration and cooperation across uh, the numbered fleets within the Navy. And, uh, and so, you know, as we look ahead in that great power competition, 
Um, the largest democracy in the world is, uh, is just a few miles across that, that imaginary line from, from us. So um, you know, we continue to, uh, to look to pull different new partners into CMF and to, to build those partnerships. Uh, and uh, you know, with, with the understanding of, of command and control, you know, we, we are um, we continue to work with India. And this is where, when I talk about like-minded partners who have political differences, you know, um, we, we have another very important regional partner called Pakistan. And, uh, and, and while India and Pakistan, um, you know, I, I wouldn't downplay the um, competition that <laughs> they have against each other. Um, there are shared interests in the maritime. And so, you know, our, our goal is to achieve shared maritime security in a way that it builds trust in both those partners with us and, and other partners in the region, I think, is so a key enabler, again, to that security. So, so we, 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 we're going to continue to build that, those partnerships within the Gulf, and, uh, and we continue to look out. You know, Fifth Fleet is often was defined uh, for a number of years by CVOA4 in the Northern Arabian Gulf. Um, it's, it's almost uh, a maritime support to land warfare. Um, I, you know, we're, we're much broader now, in, in not just the Red Sea, uh, not just the Strait of Hormuz and the, the Gulf of Oman, but really out into the, the broader Indian Ocean. And that's uh, um, symbolically, as as we look at the allocation of forces across the globe, you know, that there's there's a there's there's need at different times, uh, you know. Crisis of the day was notwithstanding with Iran, you know, to to, to operate here, and, and we're, we're preparing to do that. Thank you, and and just allow me to echo what you said about combined maritime forces. Um, it's a hidden gem that so many people uh, uh, take for granted. Um, and for everyone who's watching this video, um, uh, you know, combined maritime forces. If you're not familiar with it, you're interested in maritime. It's uh, the example of cooperation among. Uh, a multilateral setting uh, on addressing security threats. Um, sir, to, to transition, uh, that's really our final question. Um, we've taken up a, an ample amount of your time this afternoon, um, this morning in DC. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of NISA uh, for carving out time. Uh, General Wolf, I don't know if you want to come in and, and give any final thoughts, but uh, Brad Admiral uh, Renshaw, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Yeah, Admiral, thank you very much. It's uh, what, what a what an in incredibly interesting uh, discussion, and thanks for framing, you know, framing our your perspective and ours really not only on the command's focus, but really on kind of the greater strategic imperatives. I always love it when I get to hear a bit about Mahan again, and so you know, you didn't throw in McKinder. I thought that was coming next, but uh, it's always great hearing. And I think the other aspect of it is, as Jeff just said, the complexity of the of the the CMF task forces. Again, it, it is grossly misunderstood, and it, it builds onto this crazy narrative that, uh, you know, based on the national defense strategy, <clears throat> excuse me, and some of the comments by senior American leaders that there's this perception out there that we're leaving the Middle East, and I find it incredibly frustrating uh, when uh, people, you know, run that narrative at us as Americans, and we say, wait a minute, you don't understand. Um, there are there are vital national security interests associated with the free flow of commerce and trade. The United States will always be part of that. So thank you for making the case so fervently about uh, about your command's focus and how you see things and uh, and anchoring it to really some strategic imperatives from Mahan to the Atlantic Charter. That really that really helps, you know, uh, that really helps um, all of us who will uh, and others who will watch this uh, Watch this presentation today. And lastly, thank you for your time. Your time's incredibly valuable, and uh, and uh, you know, for you to commit nearly nearly 50 minutes of your time is deeply appreciated uh, by uh, by the NISA team and those that will watch this presentation. Thank you again from the bottom of our hearts. Sir, thank you very much.